was a farmer, and my mother was a horse. We put them together and help her as best. Don't need none of them books, nor the SAT.
phone, and whenever I received the message, I didn't need to remember something cool, I deleted it. And why didn't you delete your own when you went to him? Uh, I'm not used to deleting them. I just delete the ones I received. <laughs>
So what they did is they brought me into another interrogation room. Once I was in there, they asked me to repeat everything that I had said before. For instance, what I did that night. Um, when they asked to see my phone, which I gave to them, they were looking through my phone, which is when they found the message. While I was there, an interpreter who explained to me an experience of hers. Okay, it's physical crime. A set of daily choices expressed in a morphology, a way of dressing, a posture. Photography requests them to restore the paternalistic nature of elections, whose elitist essence has been disrupted by a proportional representation and the rule of parties. Driving in a police office, I didn't expect to be interrogated at all. When I got there, I was sitting on my own doing my homework, and a couple of police officers came up to sit with me. They began to ask me the same questions that they've been asking me for days, all these days ever since it happened. For instance, who could I imagine would be the person who killed me? And I said I didn't know. So what they did is they brought me into another interrogation room. Once I was in there, they asked me to repeat everything that I said before. For instance, what I did that They asked me to see my phone, which I gave them. And they were looking through my phone, which is when they found the message. While I was there, there was an interpreter who came in and explained to me an experience of hers. Or she had gone through a traumatic experience that she couldn't remember at all, and she suggested that I was traumatized, and that I couldn't remember the truth. This at first seemed ridiculous to me, because I remembered being at the house. For sure, I, I remembered doing things at the house. I checked my emails before, and then we watched a movie. We had eaten dinner together, and we had talked together, and during that time, I hadn't left the apartment. But they were insisting upon putting everything into hourly segments, and since I never looked at the clock, I wasn't able to tell them exactly what time I did everything. They insisted that I had left the apartment for a certain period of time to meet somebody, for which I didn't remember, but the interpreter said I had probably forgotten. Listen, when you found yourself, have No. I haven't explained what I needed to say.
That's why Lois called me. I met her four messages. I got on the machine. Three of the horses, too. Jesus. Oh, look, Tony, I, um, I just made some coffee and warm yes, eggs. Don't give me that look. It was a fucking horse. What are you, a vegetarian? You eat beef and sausage by the fucking carload. <laughs> Thank you. 
Today is a panache of red scallops and foie gras with a sauce of sauterne, which is garnished with the carrots. And basically, what we do there is we roast the scallops, roast the foie gras, we need the side of the plate, carrots down the middle, and we nap the carrots with a sauce of sauterne. So the first thing we've got to do is to actually open the scallops and remove the scallop in one actual piece rather than breaking it up because then we won't get the nice discs. So put the pipe in, 45 degree angle.
see now we're, we're reshaping the carrots. Just to warm them back up so they're still al dente. Carrots have been cooked in an emulsion. mystery and the present moment is all we have and it's a gift and that's why we call it the present what are we doing to gather right now in this present moment to prepare for tomorrow I wanted to see the children in this church these children are this church for tomorrow The programs in this church to raise the consciousness is going to be this church for tomorrow. Don't let the kid drive the bus. The higher power is the driver. All you have to do is get on the bus and trust. There's a poem that I'd like to share with you now called The Man in the Glass. When you get what you want in your struggle for yourself and the world makes you king for a day, just go to a mirror and look at yourself and see what that person has to say. For it isn't your mother or father or wife whose judgment upon you must pass. The person whose verdict counts most in your life is the one staring back from the glass. Now some people can call you a straight shooting chum and think you're a wonderful guy, but the man in the glass says you're only a bum if you won't look him straight in the eye. He's the one to please, never mind all the rest, for he's with you clear up to the end and you've passed your most dangerous and difficult test if the man in the glass can at least be your friend. You can fool the whole world down the pathway of years and get lots of pats on the back as you pass. But your final reward will be heartaches and tears if you cheat that man in the glass. And you're cheating yourself if you don't own and accept your own personal God-given power. And you're cheating yourself if you focus on anything else other than God as the source. You are meant to be a wonderful, loving expression of life. And life is waiting for you to open up to it, to feel worthy of all of the good that it offers you. The wisdom and the intelligence of the universe is yours to have and to use. Life is here to support you, but you've got to trust that power within you to be there for you. As we learn to love ourselves and trust our higher power, 
we then become co-creators with this infinite spirit. Our love for ourselves moves us from being victims to being victors. And the only difference between a victim and a victor is the I am. And the I am is your spiritual identity. That's who you are. That I am is the God part of you. So who are you? And what? I think when I would have been capable of, of really getting to know him as a, as a man and a human being. Um, but it just didn't happen. And I've always regretted that. But I, um, talking to people who knew him and finding out more about him has been, on the one hand, just fascinating because it sounds like his, his life and his personality were, were just really... Um, you know, very meaningful to a lot of different people. Well, gosh, I mean, and and on so many different levels, John. Yeah. I mean, he was, he he was meaning pers meaningful personally mm. to people like me. He affected lives, and mm. yeah. and he let you know that you you mattered. Mm. But then on a broader scale, I mean, th that man helped to build Charlotte. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he yeah. was he was president of the Chamber of Commerce at a time when Charlotte had to make some real crucial decisions mm. about its future. Well. <clears throat> and and he helped Charlotte to do that and do it in the right way. That's great. Well, uh, just you know, it was enormous influence on mm -hmm. this community. But I I enjoyed him so much in his retirement years. <laughs> you know, we spent enough time together that I really got to know him as a human being. That's and, wonderful. And he was a he was a great guy. Well, I'm envious of you for 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 yeah. knowing him that way. Well, you know, grandfathers are you know they're grandfather figures. <laughs> right. And um, I never knew either of my grandfathers. They were gone. Before before I was born, and um, so I, I know how you feel about that. I missed it too, but I'm gonna. I'll, I've got a yeah. I've got a copy of this thing, and I would love to send it. Well, I'd be delighted. I'd, I'd be very, very grateful for, for that. Okay. So, all right. I'll put it in the mail today. Well, thank you so much. All and right. I'm looking forward to meeting you personally. I, I, I certainly want you to come see the play. I, I definitely will. I'm, okay. I'm definitely going to be there, and hopefully, I will. I will meet you there. I'll, I'll pester Ken and. and Make sure that that happens. Fantastic. Good talking to All you. Right, nice talking to you, John. Thank you. Bye bye.
su wow.
Ano dyan? Thank you. 
Mr. Speaker. with ministerial colleagues and others and in addition to my duties in this house I shall have further such meetings later today.
dvojičky hoří. Já to mám na kameře. Thank you, Sir Gerald, and warmest congratulations on your new role as father of the house. Yeah. Next month will mark 45 years of your service in this place and to your constituents. Some of us will barely record half of that tenure. It has been an honor to serve as speaker for almost six years, and I would be honored to do so for a little longer, <laughs> if colleagues kindly agree. I shall strive to ensure that this house remains at the heart of our democratic system. All of its members, newcomers and veterans alike, should be part of the cast, not merely an audience. Finally, if there are five words that I would like carved on my political tombstone, such items are not now forever unfashionable, <laughs> they are, he was the backbencher's champion. Yeah. On this basis, I submit myself to the House. Yeah. I call Mr. Jacob Rees Mong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. um, thank you, Sir Gerald. May I add my congratulations? to you becoming father of the house in succession to the much regarded and loved Sir Peter Tapsell. Yeah. It, it is indeed a tribute to your long service to this nation that you now take the chair of our proceedings. Uh, in response to the gracious message which we have received from the Sovereign, directing us to elect a speaker, I beg to move that the right on John Simon Burkell do take the chair as speaker. It has been the habit of this house to continue with a speaker who wishes to continue to serve. And this is for very important constitutional reasons. The speaker is the champion of the House of Commons against all comers. The champion of the Commons against the Lords, sometimes against the judges, but perhaps most particularly against the executive. The historians here will know that some seven speakers lost their heads for championing the Commons against the Executive, something that we hope is no longer necessary. <laughs> this, this connection between the Speaker and the Commons protects us and the rights of this House, and that if we were to be light in changing our Speaker, we would find then that the Speaker spent the whole time with regard to what the front bench on one side or the other were thinking as to how he should rule, lest he should not continue in office after a general election. The last time this happened was to, was to, was to Charles Manners Sutton in 1835, who was booted out by the Whigs for being, for being too much of a Tory. I'm glad to say there aren't very many Whigs left to behave <laughs> in, this, in this way. But I want to move on from the general constitutional principle 
to the Honourable Gentleman, the Right Honourable Gentleman, the Member for Buckingham, and why I think he is so well suited to continue as Speaker. A Speaker has to have a good knowledge of Erskine May, and some new show-off backbenchers think they know a bit about Erskine May. <laughs> and I can tell you from the last Parliament I occasionally thought this, and went to the Speaker with some clever procedural strategy. Uh, he, with the wise advice of the clerks, always knows it better. And that is essential to keeping order in this place. But a good speaker must also be prompt with business. Who has not heard him say, short questions and short answers, the mantra of question time. <laughs> At short speeches. <laughs> I, I quite like long speeches. <laughs> And that has got our business through, both of questions and of statements. But the Speaker has also ensured that what the Commons wants to debate with debates, the rise of urgent questions, has been hugely important in holding the government to account, as is the selection of amendments at report stage. So what is debated is what the Commons wants. The Speaker also has the most phenomenal knowledge of members, and the new members will soon, fi soon find that Mr. Speaker not only knows their names, but he probably knows their date of birth, their weight when they were born, and he will, and he will reveal all this when they get up to speak for the entertainment of the rest of the House. Now, Mr. Speaker, or the, my or right honourable friend, the member for Buckingham, as he now is, uh, has a reputation for being a moderniser. This is a word I use with some caution. <laughs> In spite of my own prejudices, it is important that this House looks beyond its own confines to the country at large, and what he has done in terms of education has been very important to bring schools into this place and to make that more available. Though there is some hope, which I hope I'm not indiscreet in telling you, that his son Oliver, when the portrait of Mr. Speaker was unveiled, took one look at it and said, Daddy, why aren't you wearing a wig? Mr. Speaker gave an answer that had it come from a minister would not, I think, have been deemed satisfactory. So young Oliver said, I think, Daddy, you should wear a wig. I, I must confess I am with uh, Mr. Speaker's son on this, but I think my chances of success are limited. But the key virtue of the Right Honourable Gentleman is that he is impartial in this House, but he is a partisan for the House of Commons. So in here we are all equal and judged by him equally and fairly, but outside he defends our rights, our traditions and our liberties, and that is how it should be. <laughs> the question is that Mr John Burko, who take the chair of this House as Speaker, as many as are of that opinion say aye. Aye. Of the contrary, no. I think the eyes have it, the eyes have it. Yeah. 911, what's the address of your emergency? Yes, ma'am. Um, I am on Hubbard Road, right at the start curve, looking to um, access the back of the Appalachian Insight Center and the uh, Masonic Temple. Okay, and what's, uh, tell me exactly what happened. of Sir Gerald in the course of their first parliament. I should like to thank the House for again bestowing upon me the greatest honour that it can confer upon any member. I am intensely conscious of the responsibilities into which I again enter, and I shall do my best to discharge those responsibilities efficiently effectively and fairly. A 
above all, I'm conscious of the rights of backbenchers and the need to facilitate members in championing the causes dear to them and from whichever side of the house they come, holding the government of the day properly to account. your second re-election this month. I noticed during the first there was some confusion in the media as to whether my party had won 330 or 331 seats in the general election. It seems the media were unsure as to whether or not you were a Conservative. I'm sure, I'm sure you find this as baffling as I do. But Mr Speaker, it is a tribute to the inclusive way in which you've upheld this office, always, as you've just said, putting back benches first. And I'm sure you'll do that this part, just as you did in the last. resigning, be entirely sure that you really want to be Mr. Speaker, let me also welcome the right honourable lady opposite. We faced each other just like this five years ago. I think it's fair to say that since then I've lost a coalition partner, but I've gained a number of new friends. Um, in terms of her position, there's something here. on John Simon Burke, who take the chair as Speaker. It has been the habit of this House to continue with a Speaker who wishes to continue to serve, and this is for very important constitutional reasons. The Speaker is the champion of the House of Commons against all comers, the champion of the Commons against the Lords, sometimes against the Judges, but perhaps most particularly against the Executive. The historians here will know that some seven speakers lost their heads for championing the Commons against the Executive, something that we hope is no longer necessary. <laughs> this, this connection between the Speaker and the Commons protects us and the rights of this House, and that if we were to be light in changing our Speaker, 
We would find then that the speaker spent the whole time with regard to what the front bench on one side or the other were thinking as to how he should rule, lest he should not continue in office after a general election. The last time this happened was to, was to Charles Manners Sutton in 1835, who was booted out by the Whigs for being too much of a Tory. I'm glad to say there aren't very many Whigs left to behave. <laughs>